Proverbs chapter number 18. A lot of oft-quoted scripture in this chapter, not to mention verse number 24. It says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And we just sang about him. But uh, we're going to read two verses this morning and probably end up everywhere else in the Bible too. But going to begin reading in uh, verse number 20. The Bible says, A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Now, I mean, every now and then, you can find a couple of verses in the book of Proverbs that relate to each other back to back. Other times, each verse is its own thought. And or you can go to the first ten chapters of the book of Proverbs, and it's all a single letter written from Solomon to his children, to his son. But, you know, in the latter parts, it's not Solomon, it's different kings. But the Proverbs, the reason I like them so much, you know, the same guy that wrote the majority of Proverbs, Solomon, wisest man to ever live, also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Ecclesiastes tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. Right? Well, if you study the life of Solomon, you'll find out that Solomon, when he was anointed king, and he took his seat on the throne of his father David, that God sent a messenger and inquired of him what Solomon would have the Lord do for him to bestow a gift upon him. And he asked for wisdom so that he might rightly judge God's people. He didn't want to judge God's people any other way than what God said on how to judge them. And as a result of that, God said that he asked, you know, honorably, that he asked for the right thing. And because of that, even though he could have asked for wealth and for popularity or for peace or for any of these other things, God said he'll give him wisdom and everything else on top of it. Because his heart was not for him to be wise so that he would be famous. His heart was not for wisdom so that he could devise something that would make him remembered for all of eternity. He wanted wisdom so that he would know what to do as the leader of God's people. Well, if nothing new is under the sun, and Solomon's wisdom isn't wisdom of man, but wisdom of God, that means that this wisdom, being God-breathed and inspired, still just as true today. Right? These aren't outdated proverbs that, you know, are anecdotes for people to, you know, just quote the kids and try and teach them a moral lesson. They're not fables. Right? These are still truths that are just as true today as they were back when they spin. These are just as true as when God, Genesis chapter number 1, created everything. Because a lot of the proverbs deal with consequences for man's actions. Well, what determined those consequences? Well, God's law. But where did God's law come from? God's commandments. Right, so the majority of Proverbs is how to deal with other people, how to deal with yourself, advice on how not to stray away from the right path and to you know, fall victim and fall prey to the snares of the devil. And it's all just as true as it is today. They're true then, still just as true today. Right, so in these verses we find verse number 20 that a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth but what's the fruit of your mouth that's your speech that's your words okay, now when it says belly it's not literally saying that what you say is going to turn into food and you can eat it okay, what it means is that a man's belly or a man's appetite his hungers in the flesh in the body spiritually Right? You'll be satisfied with what you talk about. Okay, we'll get into why here in a second. But it says, And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Then in the very next verse, talking about the power of speech, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You want to see how Devastating or how powerful words can be. Look at verse number 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. How is a brother offended? 
Their word. You know what words are? Words are precursors to action. Long before somebody ever does something, they start talking about doing something first. So why then is death and life in the power of the tongue? Because your life, we can break it down into three things. Your physical body, your spiritual new creature that God born in you when he saved you, and then your testimony, your outward representation. All three of those things either live or die by what you say. Right? You want to, in the physical body, you, you really want to tempt fate? Go up to a police officer, tell them that you want to kill them. Right? That's not going to end well for you. You may not die. Chances are you might get hit with some pepper spray. You might get hit with a taser. He may pull out a baton and end up whooping you. Right? But where did all that start with? It just started with some words. Right? I, I know that we tell kids that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. I mean, we have to develop a little bit of callous right, to the opinions of other people. But words, right, very important, very powerful. In fact, you can ruin somebody's day with just a word. On the other end, right, you can change somebody else's perspective with the word. Same book tells us that a word fitly spro spoken is more valuable than golden apples and pitchers of silver. What's that tell us? The right word when spoken at the right time is life to somebody else. Are we not to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ? Sometimes that's just listening, but sometimes that's giving them a word that's full of life. You want your physical body, you know what most impacts your physical body? Right, The way that you live your life. You know why you live the way that you live? Because you talk about doing those things and then you go and do them. You want to know why words are so powerful? Because the Bible tells us that the mouth speaks out of the abundance of the heart. You want to know what comes out your mouth? What's in your heart? You want to know why life and death are in the tongue? Because on the inside, either you're trying to grow or you're trying to destroy. Maybe not yourself, but others. Your words, that we know that Jesus said, right, that if he make us a new creature, what are we, we're grafted into the vine, the true vine. Right, the true vine does one thing, grow. Right, man cannot serve two masters, so love one and hate the other. So if we're not growing, what are we doing? We're dying. Well, the words that we speak, what do they do? They either testify to the fact that we're doing our best to grow spiritually, or that we have a desire that's other than Christ and that we're dying spiritually. You know somebody that is alive spiritually? Like Jeremiah, they figured out they've got a fire shut up in their bones and they just want to let the thing burn and consume them. Replace everything that they used to be. Lord, you must increase. I must decrease. You know what the words of that person will do? They will speak life to other people. It will be a testimony of the fact that their life is all about continuing, being alive, others being revived, those that are lost in trespasses and sin, dead in their sins, that they'd come to Christ and that they'd have a new creature born in them, a new life. I mean, Christ called it the new birth because that part of us which was dead, our soul, is made alive. But you know somebody that's miserable? Somebody that's spiritually on the inward? That it's chaos? They're starving spiritually? That they've deprived themselves of the very thing that they need, which is more of Christ? You know what their speech testifies to the fact of? That they're dying. You know what their words will have an impact on? It'll cause other things to die. It'll kill the enthusiasm of others. It'll kill the faithfulness of others. It'll kill the desires of others to grow closer to God. You say, it doesn't happen. It happens all the time. 
You know why it's often around here we are more than the exception to the rule? But you know why often when in church kids never say anything? Right? That they're never being, you know, willing to stand up and say, I want to testify what Jesus did for me. It's because somebody along the way, they did it once and somebody along the way said something to them and it killed that desire in their heart. It made them feel as if they had done something wrong when really, the Bible says that everything that hath breath to praise the Lord. But that child will resist the pull of the Holy Ghost to stand up and say something because God wants them to say something because somebody spoke something along the way that killed that passion that they had to get up and say something for Jesus. You know how many times somebody would get up and sing and just one comment from somebody and they won't sing for years? You say, well, Brother Jordan, they're supposed to be singing for Jesus. Yeah, but I'm human and you're human too. And the judgment of one person may have been wrong judgment. Right? may have been wrong for them to say it. I may know that they're wrong. But the fact that you feel like there's opposition for you doing what, it'll kill the joy and the passion that you had to do it. Life and death and the power of the tongue. You may say, well, Brother Jordan, they never actively stood up and tried to stop them from singing. No, because one word did it. I can't get on that point yet. We got to wait. We got to wait. Okay, but man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. We've already said that words come from the abundance of what's in your heart. You want to know what you talk about? The thing that you desire. The thing that you are passionate about. And you want to know what your life will be filled with? Doesn't mean that you'll be satisfied. But you want to know what you're going to be eating on? The things that you talk about the most. The things that truly you desire in your heart I mean we all know we've heard the preaching I think I've taught on it I'm sure I've taught on it at some point may not be able to tell you when but right we're supposed to lay up treasures in heaven our desires are not to lay up treasures here wood hay and stubble but our desire should be that our heart be situated in heavenly places I, my name's already recorded there the Bible says that I'm seated in heavenly places that means that you know, in the eyes of God, that new body that he's going to give me one day during the rapture, the one that's going to be just like his, that body, he already sees me seated in heavenly places. The only thing that it there is my spirit and my heart. I can't make my spirit go to heaven. Spirit's stuck in this thing until God separates it. But you know what I can put in heaven? My desires, my heart. That can be situated there. Or those things that are in my heart can be carnal that's one or the other man cannot serve two masters we've already been over that but see whatever's in my heart that's what I'm going to be hunting for right I don't know that this is true because I wasn't alive during the 1800's but I played a lot of video games from the 1800's where you're, car you're hunting you're trapping you're looking for things you run into a lot of people where they're looking for something else you got to help them go hunt down this giant whatever or another, the world's biggest bear or whatever it is. You know what they ask you when they run into you? Hey, you seen any bear tracks? Hey, you see any fur that's this color? I've been tracking this for a while. What's their desire? It's to find whatever's at the end of the trail. You know what they're talking about when they run into new people? They're trying to find out if they've got any information that'll help them get to where they desire to be. We're no different. When we sit down, we talk to people, when we're on the job and we're just talking, making small talk, you know the things that often come out of our mouth, the things that mean the most to us. We're asking for information to see if they know something about the things that we care about. We're talking about the things that we're passionate about, trying to make them interested in the things that we care about. That's what your words do. They're just a direct representation of what's down here. You can mask your words for a while, but eventually you're going to start talking about what you really care about. 
You know what you'll be filled with? The things that you talk about. Because that's what you desire and that's what you're going to keep pursuing. You may not, you know, ever get it. May never find, you know, the gold at the end of the rainbow if we're talking about carnal things. But you know what you will be filled with? The desire to have it. The desire to pursue it. And if it's something that you can never attain down here in this world, a lot of people want recognition. You know what that person will never have enough of? Recognition. They're nev they'll never be validated. Because not enough people recognize them. You know people that just want attention? Right? The class clowns? They act out once. Well, they got attention, but that wasn't enough. They want more attention. You know somebody that's seeking internet fame? One like, one comment, one repost is never enough. They need more. Well, they may never get it, but you know what they're going to be filled with? The pursuit of it. Then, latter parts of verse number 20 says, And with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. I remember, I don't remember how old I was. I think it was down when they had just opened up that new movie theater down there in Wilder that now is like 20 something years old. Right? I remember when it first opened and we went down there. And I remember I had a huge thing of popcorn because with my grandpa being the chief of police, we got free tickets because he was the chief of police of Wilder. So we didn't have to pay for the tickets, so guess what we all got? Big drinks, big popcorn. I was, the thing was probably about as big as I was, and I was going to do my best to eat all that popcorn. You know what happened before the movie was over? I got sick. Why? Because I was filled with something, but it wasn't good for me. It says, with the increase of their lips... What's that? That's them reaping what they sow. If all they talk about is something, guess what they're going to reap? Either more desire, more ambition, more drive to go and pursue it, or they're going to get little morsels of it. But if you obsess over something that isn't good for you, you know what eventually it's going to do? It's going to make you sick. In the beginning, there's just enough to get you hooked. But eventually, you'll start forsaking those things which you ought to do to chase after something that you may never obtain. But, on the flip side, right, if our desires truly are the things of God, those things never die. Those things can never not be alive because they're born of the one that is. That's what Jehovah means. The one that lives. Right? He is alive. So therefore, everything that He does is alive. We are alive because of Him. Right? Those things can satisfy you. But in order to be satisfied, what do you have to do? You have to be filled. You know what words that pertain to what God would have us to do? You know what the result of that is? Stronger desire to do things for God, a stronger ambition. Right? More resolve to forsake those things which would interfere with those things that are in our heart that we desire. But on the flip side, again... Somebody that's on fire for God, you know what will cause that desire to fade? When they stop talking about it. Doesn't it say, verse number 21, life and death are in the power of the tongue? You know what keeps your spirituality alive? Your speech. You know what causes your spirituality to die? A lack of speech. Because if you're intimidated to say it, if you're afraid to say it, if you're worried about what somebody will think if you say it, you know what you do? You stifle or you kill that desire in your heart. By holding it in, all you're doing is telling that, you're telling your heart, you're telling your spirit, well, that's not important enough to bring up. He said, well, Brother Jordan, that can't be that big of a deal. If you only did it once, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But you know what happens when you do it once? You'll do it again and again and again until what? Eventually that passion which once was everything that you had is dead by the wayside. It's been replaced by whatever you've started talking about in its stead. 
when somebody stops talking about something, it's a direct representation that their passion for it has waned. It's gotten weaker. Some of it's natural. I don't go around talking about Legos anymore, but there's a time in my life when Legos were very important to me. I used to make back caves and every other kind of thing out of it. In fact, I think those Legos are still around somewhere. Came in a big old yellow tub. Right? And they were built to last. Them suckers are indestructible. They'll last, you know, cockroaches and that Lego set will make it through a nuke. But I don't talk about Legos no more. As much as we joke that George likes Star Wars, I really don't talk about Star Wars all that much. It's usually only when Brother Tommy brings it up. Right? We're going to blame him. But truly, when somebody stops talking about something, it's because they've lost their passion for it. Something down here has changed, which has caused them to talk about it less. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Just the mere fact of you talking about something that you care about keeps that passion alive. I mean, let's just take this for an example. Okay. Let's say that but Brian, back in the day, may not have been the best, but he liked playing baseball. Okay, may not have been the best, but he liked playing it. Right, well, as long as he talked about how much he liked baseball, he'd still do his best to go out there and have a good time, be the best he could be, and enjoy playing it. But because one coach said something to him one time, or because a parent said something to him one time, he stops talking about it as much. Then it's not a joy to go play while he's playing. You know what he's thinking about? Whatever that person told him. Every time he goes to put on his equipment, every time he's getting ready to step into the batter's box, you know what he's thinking about? Everything but how much he likes playing baseball. Until eventually he just stops doing it. But you know where that all started with? Somebody caused him something in his life that caused him to stop talking about it. You know when you really care about something? When instead of just thinking about it, you start talking about it. When you start talking about it, that's when you know that it's serious enough that somebody might do it. You say, well, words are just, they're, they're empty. No, words convey what's in your heart. There may be no power in words. You know where the power is? It's in the somebody believes them. Now, I can say something nasty to you, but if you don't believe that I'm in it, it's not going to mean anything to you. The words aren't what hurt. It's when you believe that I believe what I just said. That's when it hurts. Because you know that somebody's serious about it. Right? Somebody can walk in and call me Shrek. It's not going to affect me. Because right, I'm not green and I don't look like an ogre. Not gonna, <laughs> that's not going to hurt me. Right? But if somebody came in and said something that I could tell they really believed it, more so than the fact that they believed it, but the thought that would go on in my head is, well, what gave them cause to think that? Did I do something that caused them to think that? Right? Then we're on a whole different track. All I'm thinking about is, well, why does that person believe it? Doesn't matter why they believe it. Right? Truth is, either it's true or it's untrue. But we don't think that way. Because we don't feel in black and white. We feel in every color of the rainbow. God didn't make us robots. But if you study your Bible, the people that face the most controversy, you know the ones that kept their passion, their faith, their devotion to God through it all? You know what they all have in common? Even in their hardest moments, they were still talking about the thing that they loved. Paul and Silas, just been beaten, thrown into prison. What are they doing at midnight? They're praying and they're singing praises unto God. Got David on the run. Saul's trying to kill him. He's having to take refuge among the Philistines, his enemy. Right? Everybody wants to kill David except for God and those that are with him. You want to know what he was doing? He was writing Psalms. He was singing unto God. Even if he was singing with a broken heart and he was pouring out his heart to God, 
Go read some of the Psalms. Not all of them are nice and happy. It's Lord today. I feel like I'm in the bottom of the pit. Lord, I need you to reach down and pick me up. But you know what his speech always talked about? That his faith and that his reliance was upon God. We can go throughout the whole book. Those that lost their passion for God fell away from God because they stopped talking about Him. Because if you talk about it, you got to think about it. If you talk about it, it's going to stoke that fire of your desire. It's going to remind you of how much you really do care about it. But then the third part, that testimony... Right? When you talk about something, other people know that you talk about it. Other people will know that you care about it. They may not care about it, but they'll know that you care about it. But you know what it takes to kill a testimony? Just to stop talking. You can still live the exact same way. You can still do the exact same routine, but people can tell that you've lost your passion for it. doesn't matter that you do it. What matters is, is that it's important to you. There's a lot of people do a whole lot of things that they don't want to do. I'd say chiefly, pay taxes. Nobody wants to do it, but they still do it. Right? Nobody's passionate about standing up and paying taxes. Oh, you're like, except maybe Bill, Miss Billy. Nobody's talking about taxes until they realize, oh, I got to pay him again this year. Right? But somebody that is passionate about something I'm not saying they've got to get up and give a long winded speech right that they've got to get up and testify in front of co-workers but it's just the little faith every time I talk to him he's always talking about church may not be preaching to him but you're talking about how much you love coming to church how excited you are that God did something in church that you're just overwhelmed with the fact that God would want to do something with you that you're flabbergasted by the fact that God in heaven, a holy God, would not only want to save you, but that he'd choose to bless you on purpose. Right? People that walk around, and when you say, how you doing today? It's pretty rare that you hear it, but if they say blessed, you know what I know? That person believes that they're blessed. What do you get most of the time? I'm doing okay. All right, I'm fine doing better than I deserve well that doesn't mean that you're blessed that just means that you're waiting on reaping what you sowed you can tell everything about a person on the inside just from listening to them and you know people say when a quiet person says something you better pay attention usually it's only when they care the most that they say something you don't even have to say a lot all you have to do is say it. He said, well, Brother Jordan, I can't, I can't explain to somebody what Jesus did for me. M be honest, I can't get into the nitty-gritty details of what he did for me, how he did it, you know, what process he went through. But all I know is, is that I'm not what I used to be. That's all you need to know. You don't have to go on to a you know, into a long theological explanation about what happened when you got saved. All you've got to explain is that life now is grand and before it wasn't. Before I was blind, groping in the darkness, and now I've got the light of His Word to lead me and guide me into all truth. Right? But we've already hit on the fact that your words are important because your words come from the abundance of the heart that means you can't contain it no more you start talking about something when you're so passionate or when you love something so much that you can't help but talk about it yeah, well the book of James tells us that the tongue one it's a hard thing to tame that if a man offend in word not that he's a perfect man he's a complete man that if you can master your tongue you could steal, steer your entire life you know why James said that? Because life and death and the power of the tongue. And whatever you say, that's what you're going to be filled with. And that's what you're going to reap. And that's, again, from the increase of your words is what you're going to continue to live on. 
Now, I've heard it for years. One, it's true. But even on your worst day, if you just thank God for what He did, what He's going to do, even if you don't know what it is, just the fact that He hadn't forgot about you. Because of verse number 24, there's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. Right, if you start praising God even on your lowest day, you know what you're going to be filled with tomorrow? More praise for God. You know what the Word promises us? He inhabits the praise of His people. You want God to show up when you're at your lowest? Just start praising Him. You don't have to praise Him for the hardness that you're in right now. Praise Him for who He is, what He's already done. And the fact that you're still here means He's not done with you, which means He's got something He wants to do with you. I mean, we're all without excuse to praise Him no matter how we feel on any given day. Right? For what He's already done for us. For the fact that He's still got the oxygen left on and we can breathe. Right? But you seriously start praising God and saying, Lord, I know that right now I don't feel like it. But Lord, there's a passion in my heart for more of you. And I know that you show up when people start praising you. Lord, I'm just going to believe that your word's true and I'm going to praise you. You know what you're going to have tomorrow? More God. Am I saying he's going to roll back the clouds and step out right in front of you and reveal himself? No, but he inhabits the praise of his people. You want to get closer to God, start praising his only begotten son that he is given a name which is above every other name. The one that he loves so much because I mean, in the teens class, Seth asked me, I did a thing where anonymously the kids could write down questions that they want answered. Could be about Bible things, could be about social things. I'd answer it from the Bible. Well, somebody wrote down, Seth, can we go through the timeline of the end times? Okay, let's take three months to go over that. Right? But no, we're like, I think tonight will be, I think week three. All right, we haven't even made it through the tribulation period. We said, I got the millennial reign and all of eternity to go through, not to mention all the judgments. Okay? We haven't even touched on, on what's going on in heaven while the great tribulation is going on down here. That's what he's saying. There's a lot going on there. Okay? But, we start looking ahead. We start truly thinking about well, what do we care about? You know what I know them kids care about? They each said it in their own way, but they wrote down a question that was dear to them. They all wanted to know more about what God said on certain things. You know what the worst thing I could do is? Not answer one of them questions. Because it'd show them that I don't think that it's important enough to talk about. You know what that'll cause them to do? They'll stop talking about it. Because somebody that, you know, like it or not, they may not have chosen it, but that's the teacher of their class. That's somebody that, in their eyes, should know a thing or two. So if I don't answer it, they think, well, it's not important. It's the worst thing we could do. But personally, let's take that into everyday life. You want to know when people know you're serious about something? We can talk about it. You don't have to go on and on about it. You ask somebody, well, how was your weekend? They talk about their, the thing that they did with their grandkid. I know they love their grandkid. Right? If they talk about how angry they are because of what somebody did, I know that they're pretty serious about being angry about what that person did. I may not care. I may not want to listen to it, but I know that they care about it. You say, well, Brother Jordan, why is that so important? Because to get back to James, your tongue, just like a bridle on a horse's mouth and an rudder on a big sailing boat it controls the way that your life goes what you talk about is the way that your ship's going to steer or the way that your horse is going to start walking it's not a conscious it's just the way that God made us the thing that we talk about is the thing we're going to be looking at the thing that we're going to be walking towards and the thing that we're going to be in our minds thinking about what we need to do to get to wherever that thing that we're talking about is why do you think so many times in the book of Psalms the psalmist said that, that his mouth would be filled with the praise of God? Because he knew as long as he kept his attention. You know what you do when you talk about something? 
You're focusing on it. You're thinking about it. Well, if you continue to praise, if you continue to talk about the things of God, find somebody else that cares about what you care about and the things of God. I mean, you do realize that's what they used to do in the early church. It said daily they met in each other's houses. You know why they were showing up? Because they was asking, you know, it could have been one of the deacons, could have been one of the apostles, could have been one of the preachers that's called to preach since then. But they were asking those that have been around longer than them, hey, I want to know more about this. And you know who started showing up at that guy's house on that day? People that wanted to know that answer too. And you know where they went the next day? They went to the house where the guy had the same question that they had, and they were all there to get the same answer. You know why the early church grew spiritually so quickly? Because they were willing to talk about the things that they wanted to know. When you talk about things that you want, one, you're admitting towards God in humility, Lord, I don't know it all. Two, you're asking Him, Lord, I don't know it, but I desire to know it. You're reinforcing towards God your desire to know more about Him and to know more about His Word and to know more about His will for your life. You know what that causes down here? That just stirs that desire and keeps it fresh and new. But see, there's also a very important verse in the Bible. Since the dawn of time, this has been true. Until the end of all of eternity, this will be true. When God said, let there be light, this was a part of that fact. You know what happened when he said, let there be light? There was light. And you know what that meant? It separated light and darkness. Right? There was a cause and an effect. And the verse says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What is the overarching truth of all creation? Whatever you do today does have consequences down the road. It may be a day, it may be a week, it may be instant, or you may not reap it until you get to eternity and stand before God in judgment. But the truth is, is that what you do matters. What you say matters. But see, the beginning part of that verse, it doesn't say, don't deceive other people. It says, be not deceived. In other words, don't buy in to the deception. But what's that deception? We can go all the way back to the garden. It worked back then, it still works today. In fact, it's the biggest deception that you and I still to this day fight against when it comes to the snares and the traps of the devil. What did the serpent tell Eve? Ye shall not surely die, and ye shall become as gods, knowing the difference between good and evil. What did he tell her? There's no consequence for your act. You will not reap what you sow, and instead, you're going to be elevated or promoted to a new state as a lowercase g God because you know the difference between right and wrong. You know what that tells me? Old Slewfoot, Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him. He thinks that he's a God because he knows the difference between right and wrong. Up until he had rebelled against God, all he knew was right because he's doing what God created him to do. But now that he knows the difference between good and evil, he thinks that he's better than almost anybody out there. In fact, we know that he thinks he deserves to sit on the throne of God. You know what the truth is? God doesn't know evil. He is holy. All he knows is holiness and righteousness. But God understood that anything that wasn't holy needed a place to go, and that's why he created hell for the devil and his angels. What's the greatest deceit? Be not deceived. What's that deception? That what you talk about doesn't matter. That what you do doesn't matter. That you can talk about certain things and do certain things and still be spiritually right with God. That you can take a day off from your spirituality 
that you can just take some time to decompress and think about and talk about whatever you want to. Be not deceived. Because what you talk about is what you're eventually going to care about. Sometimes we talk because we care so much. Other times, because of what we talk about with other people, we start caring about new things. It infects us. It grabs a hold, and then we start thinking about it and talking about it more, and the cycle repeats. The same is true with noble endeavors, with righteous things. The more you think about them, the more you're going to talk about them, the more you're going to do them, and it's a cyclical rep repetition but you know what that does? It keeps it alive in your heart. But what's the second part of that verse? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You know what happens when you talk about something that maybe you know you shouldn't be talking about? When you give voice to the desire in your heart that is contrary to what you know God would have you to do, you know what that does? It mocks the Almighty God. You know why? Because you believe that you can get away with saying it. Another commandment of God, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know what happens when we give voice to those things that we know are carnal, that we know will divert our attention away from the things of God? Not saying they've got to be wicked just knowing that we ought to spend more time with God and we give voice to things instead of spending more time with God. You know what that does? It, you're flying in the face of God, the fact that He saved you, and you're tempting Him to correct you. Saying, well, God, I can do this and not suffer the consequence. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. No one has ever made a fool of God. Like I said, you may not have to pay the price today, but there's a day, if you're saved, where you're staying before the judgment seat of Christ. You know what the Bible tells me? We've got to give an account of every deed done in this body after the day we've got saved. I don't have to give an account of my sin. That was judged to Calvary. I've got to give an account of how I dealt with the precious gift of the Son of God being alive in me. And you know what happens when I talk about what I shouldn't talk about? I'm killing the desire of the new creature because you know what it desires to be what God wants it to be but you know what the carnal man wants to be what it used to be the battle often is fought up here in what we think about but once we decide to start talking about something you know what usually happens we're going to keep talking about it until we either run out of stuff or until somebody tells us shut up you know what happens when we talk about things that we know that we shouldn't talk about? Something that we know we can address later, but instead we're going to talk about it now instead of doing business with God? You know what that does? You're daring God to make you pay the price for dis disobedience. We know obedience is greater than sacrifice. But what we're telling God is, God, I can live for you on my own terms and on my own time doesn't matter that you want to deal with me about something now I'm going to talk about this instead you know what that does it kills the desire you're going to be filled with that fruit that you just put out into the world you know what's going to happen the next time you go to do business with God somebody else is going to come up and want to talk about something phone's going to ring TV's going to turn on your favorite show Right, you're going to get a notification that there's just a new episode added to your favorite TV show on whatever streaming service you use. Right, your favorite song's going to come on the radio. Random thoughts about things that you didn't even realize were in your head are going to start popping in. Why? Because you gave in once and talked about something you shouldn't have. So if you... If the devil can get you to start talking about something that you shouldn't have in the first... You know why Eve eventually bought into what the devil was saying? Because she started talking with him back and forth. She tried to correct him, but she even quoted what God said wrong. You know what that told the devil? She don't care enough. Because if she cared enough, she'd know what God said on it. And what did he do? He just started talking. 
And eventually that talk gave way to deed. And that deed caused another to buy into the deed. And death passed upon all men. For all have sinned. Where did it all start with? With words. He said, well, Brother Jordan, let's be honest. How often do you actually think about what you say before you say it? Most of the time we just talk instinctively, reactionally. What was the last time that we thought, truly, well, what I'm talking about right now is what my future is going to be? Now, I'm not talking, if somebody asks you a question at work about something about work, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when you're talking to other people, those things that matter to you, that's what you're going to talk about. The things that you approach other people about, that's what your future is going to be filled with because that's what's important to you. You know, the easiest way to change the desires of your heart is start talking about how you want a different desire. You want a stronger desire for the things that God, start talking about how you desire to know more about God. Because when you put footsteps or when you put words behind that desire, that's when it becomes real. You can hope for something all day long, but until you do something, what's the first step in action? Actually talking about doing it. Because if you never talk about doing it, you're not going to do it. You may talk about it with yourself. You may talk about it with somebody else. You may talk about it with God. But you've got to start talking about it before you actually do it. So why? Is death and life in the power of the tongue? Because what you talk about is what you're going to do. You know you're serious about something when you say, I'm going to do it. Because before that, it's just an idea, it's a thought, it's a passion. Now it's real. You've acknowledged it, and you've accepted it. And by simply saying, Lord, I desire more, you're asking God to say, God, give me more of you, because more of me isn't enough. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.